was going to do it. So, yeah, so here now there is an implication of an ocean that is wide and deep. And on the earth, the roads are many, and the earth itself is vast. So therefore, there is the need to have a destination and the good sense to choose a path that will get us there in a manner where both the individual, now it's important also, if we're on a journey together and we are in the task of navigating, then in this journey, it's important that our fellow tra travelers also enjoy the trip. In this instance, we are looking to the Vedas and Vedic literature to find that route and plot our paths in accordingly. Two things, we're looking at the navigating of the Vedas in looking at solutions and also how do we navigate and how do we try and look into the Vedas for this. So when we look at the ocean, uh, you know, like I mentioned to you in the next slide, the idea about choosing a destination and plotting a path, then we talk about the fear the fear of the ocean, right? the depth of the sea, and in the case of the earth, the vast terrain. So it is this fear then that tends to intimidate us. But then what do we see on the sea? And that is the simple boatman who is rowing his boat. And then that gives us an inspiration. So it shows us that the skillful boatsman navigates it easily because he knows the simple skills on how to row his boat through such waters. So now the next part we speak is about our daily routine and you know, the simple rites and rituals and how we have become very mechanical in performing them. Now, this is a problem often not just in any religion. Over time, and you may know Aurobindo's famous saying about, you know, where the stream is clear and the reasoning is clear, and then slowly that st stream of reasoning flows into the desert of dead habit. These things become habit and become mechanical. So then because it's mechanical, right? The observance becomes very tedious. And, uh, but life, as we all know, life is mechanical. But what happens is, because we all are involved in a daily routine, which is equally boring, we know that we're going to earn a salary at the end of the month. Right? And therefore, we realize we have to persevere. So the routine and boredom then become dedication and commitment for the good of oneself, of family and society. So sometimes these have to be done and then there comes a resultant dedication and commi uh, commitment. Spirituality then also requires this kind of daily discipline. So the same with spirituality and all that with, goes with all our practices, right? So then we only, you know, if we do it with love and faith and we learn then to enjoy the routine. Right? People daily, when we have our breakfast, our lunch and supper, that's also daily routine, but we don't regard it as boring. We look forward to that breakfast. We look forward to that meal. And none of us says, oh my, do I have to go through this boring process of eating every day? Right? So similarly, we have to learn to enjoy our routine. Right? Be it at work, be it in our prayer. Right? And then, like if you are going to work and you enjoy your work, you enjoy the company and look forward to it, then the entire experience becomes an enjoyable one. Now, these simple skills are important in understanding the Vedas because you don't necessarily have to know Sanskrit. Yes, but a simple vocabulary would help a lot. 
little skills would be the words, the Sanskrit words, simple words, like learning the strokes of how to row your boat and navigating the weather. So some simple vocabulary, which most of us know will help a lot. So let's start with the first word. And we're talking about the word there that you see Amrita on the slide. Hmm? Because when we begin a havan, uh, when we begin a havan, what, whichever prayer we do, we start with a purification rite, and generally it takes the form of the sipping of water. The sipping of the water is a sign of internal spiritual cleansing. Hmm? So in the first two mantras of the havan, we say Om Amrito Pastaranamasi, Om Amrita Apridhanamasi. So we use the word Amrita. Just a little bit of thinking, deliberation on the word A plus Mrita. Mrita people, again, it will help you to know words like mortis, mortality, right? and that which is opposite, that is immortal, Mrita. And that which is not mortal, which does not die, is Amrita. So the word Amrita then uh, is concerned with transcending death. So while some religions offer us a heaven and hell, uh, some take death to be the end of all and be all of everything. Some speak of hell and heaven, but the Vedas are in search of an existence that goes beyond the mortal body. Is there something beyond the mortal body? Right? And all of us know when we go to the crematorium, I'm sure you've listened to the speeches so often that the earth is returns to the earth, etc. When you look at that body, they, you don't even call the body by the name anymore. So what is it, what is it that is mrita and what is it that is amrita, what dies and what does not die? So the Vedas then are concerned with the state of existence hmm, beyond the mortal body. And then we are told that nothing dies. All that happens is there is a change from the form to the formless, back to the form, and this is the cycle of creation. See? And the Gita says that they use the word vyakta. Everything at the big at the beginning, avvyaktadini eh? bhutani. At the beginning, everything is unmanifest. Then it becomes manifest only to become unmanifest again. Very simply. You look at the sky, there's nothing there. Absolutely nothing. But we know there's water there. Because if there's no water, the cloud will not form. So the water there is in the vapor. It's formless. It'll take a form. Right? The water. And that water form is the mrita form. And it'll become the streams. It'll go through the mountains, the rivers, etc. Go to the ocean. And in the process of evaporation, it becomes amrita, that subtle form, formless form. And that cycle continues, it assumes the form again. So now, when we're talking about amrita, and I said to you that it is there at the beginning of the hour. Now look at this, we're talking about it, Karuna. You spoke about yes. navigation. Is it? So when you're working with your GPS, hmm, and you're setting your navigation. When you have a GPS, what must you do? Firstly, you set your destination. When you're navigating your journey, you set your destination. So at the beginning of the Havan, or any prayer that you do, right, by this act of Amrita, we are saying that our destination is Amrita, the realization of mrita, that which dies, and amrita, that which does not die. So amrita is our destination. And the next thing the GPS wants to know is what is your route? How are you going to go there? And the third mantra says, uh, 
satyam. Right? So satyam then in the next mantra is satyam. Yashaha Shriir Mai through Satya may I acquire Yashaha, my good name and my prosperity. So now simple words there, Satyam we know is truth, Amrita is immortality, and of course each time Om, that sound that resonates and inheres in everything. So then these simple words and tools, even if one does not know the Sanskrit, are like the seeds of knowledge. Right? We call them bija mantras. Why are they called mantras called bija? Because when you plant an acorn seed into the earth, what happens? It grows into a huge tree from that little seed. So a mantra is like that. When you take that amrita and as a seed, and when it unfolds, there's a whole meaning, a whole exposition that just comes out of one word, Amrita, and the realization of death, mortality, immortality. All of it is in that seed. And our discourses unravel that meaning. So now we've set our garment and we've set our GPS. Now, you see, in this one here, I've tried to tell you how the Vedas literally set you on a path. Right? And we're going to go towards the end. We're going to do the end mantras of the Havan as well and see what it says about how we then apply this to our life. But now, besides the spiritual element, right, which is one part of looking at the Vedas and seeing where the Vedas are directing us, and then a simple thing like the Havan is telling us what we should be working towards so that we don't just sip the water as a mechanical act, but rather begin to understand it. Right? So the next part I want to take you to, uh, don't have a lot of time, and I want to try and take a few examples to see how we scan Vedic literature and take certain issues that become a problem and how they are given to us in the Vedas and how we trace them over the other uh, literature that we have. Now, I've chosen gambling because of its relevance today. And uh, you just have to go to the Sun Coast and see what happens at the casino there and who is there in the largest number. And uh, you'll realize then why in the Vedas, you see, look at the slides, you'll find that in the Vedas, so long ago, if you place the Vedas, even according to Western deity, at 6,000 BC, uh, or 4,000 BC, 6,000 years ago, even if you set it there by Western deity. Uh, so, so long ago, in the Veda, there is a hymn. Uh, so, 1034, there's on the slide there. And this is how the Vedas talk about gambling. Hmm? Now, it says, him book 10, Rig Veda book 10, him 34. Huh? It says, it, dis, it starts, look at that slide there, people, so important. It starts with the slide there saying, the large swift rolling dice gladden me. Huh? Rolling on the table like torrents. Like torrents, please. People, <laughs> amazing. Today we go to the tables and you have those rolling dice there. And there's a picture in the Vedas, 6,000 years ago. Now the torrents here are, you know, we speak of a desert where there is no water. Man generally has an unquenching thirst for material wealth. The dice represents the overflowing oasis in the middle of a desert, dry, barren, and unproductive. So that, that torrent of water, although it may seem like it's great, but it's something temporary and it's in the midst of a barrenness. And in the following verse, it speaks, it describes the anger and frustration of a wife 
the wife whose husband is a gambler. And look at what he says. For the sake of the dice, I gave up my darling wife. The wife and the mother, they revile him, they curse him. They are neither family nor friends. They have all turned against him. And the next one, man, you know, we're going to be comparing this with the Mahabharata. So just look at it. Subsequently, we've got the Mahabharata coming later. But it makes this statement, very distressing statement, when he says, others caress my wife. Now that the dice have swallowed my wealth. Look at the Mahabharata. What happened to Draupadi? This is in the Vedas, well before the Mahabharata. They play the dice and they gamble. After they've lost all the wealth, there you are. The Kauravas say, now you Draupadi, they play a hand on it. Obviously, the ideas were wrong, malicious, but that is how it was. So what, there's a distinct parallel between the Mahabharata. And so besides losing the wealth, the palaces, the brothers, eventually they lose the wife, Draupadi. The Kauravas thereupon humiliate, abuse and shame her in the presence of the assembly. And, you know, you look at what she says. What does Draupadi say? You know, says, if you have loved and revered the mothers. Hmm? See, you'll see it next to the slide there. If you have loved and revered, right? The mothers who bore you and nurtured you. If the honor of wife or sister or daughter has been dear to you, if you believe in God and Dharma, forsake me not, don't forsake me in this horror more cruel than death. But there you are, the Vedas speak about how the women suffer, become victims of gambling, and the Mahabharata is evidence of it. Hmm? Then it was unfortunately Karuna, and there's a slide that has got, I've missed out somehow. The second half, if you go back to the verse, sorry, if you go back to the earlier one, where the verse is, I'm going to continue and the second slide got left out. I'm sorry about that. But this verse continues, there's a second half to it. And it goes on to say, right, you know, how often we hear of addicts wanting to give up their addiction to alcohol, gambling, and the abuse of others, but fail to truly remedy their weakness. No matter how hard they try, they cannot give up and they remain weak willed and blaze along the path to self destruction and devastation. Now, the part that I've left out, the line says, the sound from the gambling dens lure me. So the gambler is saying, when I hear these sounds, they lure me, they attract me. And this sound refers to the jingling coins, <laughs> the jingling of coins uh, in our machines, in our casinos. Remember people, I'm not talking too much about it. I hope you relate it to our experiences today. Uh, so the jingling of coins, and uh, it, you know, so it goes on to say that he is lost in a fool's paradise. He says, I am lost in a fool's paradise where temptation lures, but the rewards are always elusive. Right? Look at the rewards right? and how it, you know, eludes us all. How many times did the Pandavas roll the dice thinking, maybe this time I will be lucky? Man, by his nature, generally does not learn from his mistakes. And after having lost the first round, Yudhishthira is again beguiled and entranced into chasing for that elusive and deceptive dream. The dice continues to deceive and torment and goad me. Right? It is true that the gambler strikes it rich, but only for a moment. This is just a fleeting dream. Remember, I'm taking all of this from the second half of the game, uh, of that verse. The gambler feels elated, smug, and is overcome by exhilaration. But in his drunken stupor, the chase begins 
over and over again. The winnings, when he does win, the winnings are poison sweetened with honey. When the dice is rolled, no one can command its outcome. What the result will be, nobody knows. The dice is no longer under man's control or dominance. No king, friend or enemy presides over it. It becomes an object of worship. If I may come back to our machines nowadays, if you look at the picture, look at how we sit. These are our modern day gods that we go and do dan to. These are our temples, our casinos, where we all go and where we won't give a little bit of dan to the temple, we'll give our thousands to these gods, one-armed bandits. So the wife is forever forlorn, wretched and abandoned. She becomes a destitute and watch this, helpless and miserable. It is not surprising then that she turns for the care and protection right, of her children. She turns and she's driven by desperation and then she begins to do that which she did not, she did not for the sake of her children. He drowns in deaths, the loan sharks close in and the nets entangle him. Right. So he is stifled and smothered by his own puerile and naive deeds. When the gambler looks around, he sees other happy, content wives and mothers satisfied in their life. He envies them, their homes, their peace and serenity. Their little shacks up their palaces hmm, with spiritual wealth and joy. But when the morning comes, he, he sees all this. He sees others happy. When the morning comes, he can't resist it. He once again goes to the gambling tables and the dice. And the cycle continues. So the question arises then, is there a solution to escape from this problem? And this verse ends, like I said, once again, I apologize, it's not here in the second half, but the verse finishes off and it says, hmm, the answer is, is a resounding yes. The Veda says, tend to your lands. Tend to your lands, your cattle, your wife, and your home. This is the verse taken. The last verse of this, the gambler's woe. It says, tend to your lands, your cattle, your wife, and your home. It is only through hard toil and sweat that we will earn our wealth. We will cherish and treasure our gains only if they are gathered by honest labor, struggle, and exertion. And only then will the gambler's family, his community, and society be proud of such an individual. So people now, we've spoken about navigating. There you are looking at the Vedas, the hymn on gambling, going through the Mahabharata. And all those things that I mentioned play itself out in the Mahabharata. And then finally, what I have not touched on, or it is a slide there, is our present addiction to gambling. and how we even leave our children. Hmm? We'll give our children money to go and play on some machine or something so that we can go and gamble or leave our little kids in the, somewhere, you know, with a caregiver, just so that we are free to gamble. And if you look at the number of our people at these places, the story flows, you can navigate that boat coming from the Vedas through, and the scenario is the same, through the Mahabharata coming to today and the picture doesn't change very much. Okay, now the next part I want to take you through is, well, these uh, people, these slides tell you, if you're gonna gamble, you can either choose to gamble or live an honest life so that you can reap the true rewards of you know, your labor. And if it is coupled with prayer, then you are further blessed. Hmm? So that you can leave your steps, your footsteps on the sand and there will be footsteps that can be followed. Now, let's look again at how, you know, because we all use the heaven, so use the heaven to try and bring out the lessons in it. Now, in these next five slides, I'm gonna take you to the, like I said to you, I'll take you to the end of the heaven. And let's look at 
distribution. And if you talk about politics and distribution of wealth and all that, so let's talk about it. And let's see first how distribution, the word distribution is defined in the Vedas. And like I said to you, I'm going to take simple tools, take simple mantras and look at them because we chant them. Now, when we conclude our havan, right, we are making, you know, the concluding part, we're talking about the concluding part of the havan, where we made offerings of ghee and samagri. Look at the mantra that we chant there in the next slide. And it says, Vasoha pavitram asi shatadharam vasoha pavitram asi sahasradharam. Now, again, like I said to you, you may not know the Sanskrit, but just look at it and you'll understand. Dhara means a stream or a flow. So it's an easy word. Pavitra, you know, means purifying. So it says when we're finishing the Havan, Pavitram, you are the purifier. Pavitra. Right? Pavitram. What are you? Pavitram. Vasoha, Vasati means to live. So the space which you live in, Pavitram Asi, you are the purifier of that space. Pavitram Asi, you are the purifier of that space. Then what is that Pavitram? And he says the Pavitram is Shatadharam and Sahasradharam. So Shata means a hundred, Sahasra means a thousand. So, when we're offering that ghee into the fire, when we're concluding, that ghee becomes the hundred streams. And that hundred streams right, becomes a thousand streams. By that means that ghee and samagri becomes a vapor that fills this dome. Right? The fragrance purifies and fills that Vayu Mandal, that space in which we live. And look, it goes on, and it says in the next one, Devaha, right? May Devaha, may God, who is Savita, may God Savita, the creator, Tva Puripunatu Punya Kare. May he purify Twa you. Vasoha hmm, of this dwelling through Pavitrena Dharena, through this purifying Dhara, this Dhara, the stream. Hmm, may he purify this, granting your desire, the desire karma, the desire of a purification of the space. So we're talking about distribution. And the first distribution that the Veda is speaking about through this rites, through the Vedic text, is of distribution and a distribution of purification and a purification of that space around me, around you. Right? And in the next slide, you know, right? we speak of samagri and ghee and butter and one the best of ghee, best of roots and herbs, because this is now important. This is going to take us to the next stage of distribution. And we talk of Agni as being the mouth book. Right? Mukham. Agni is Mukham. The mouth Devanam of the Devas. What do we mean by that? Agni. The devas are Surya, Agni, Vayu, Prithivi, Jal. All these elements are our devatas. All these elements are our devatas. Now, we said just now, when we offer this, through this hundred and thousand streams, the air and space becomes purified. And we believe that those roots and her that fragrance goes into the elements. It goes to the surrounding trees, to the river. So that space around us, that dome around us, includes all these elements that it goes to. And you'll see in this one, the collective 
offering of the samagri yeah, is a ritual act. We'll be looking at the word ritual later on. But it receives now, it is receiving. This is the important part. The mouth receives. Then the stomach is called the agni because the agni then processes it. The Agni, through the process of combustion, processes the ghee and Samagri. And then when it, through that combustion, processes that, uh, it transforms it into a fragrance. Sugandhim Pushti Bardana. Sugandha. That fragrance, Pushti, which nourishes and fills the air. And we believe that that nourishment goes to the waters, the trees, and everything. And through that, even the clouds and the rains come. That yajya influences all of it or has a positive effect on it. So it becomes all permeating, fragrant, and makes this air, the space around is complete with the fragrance. Therefore, we say, Purnam, Sarvam, Purnam. Everything becomes replete and complete. Okay. So now if you, if you looked at that, later on I'm going to take the same process of receiving the raw material. The Samagri is the raw material. And I think you can get to where I'm going to. The raw material, the Agni then, the next process is to take that raw material and transform it through a process and make it to, to something that gets distributed. In this case, we start off with the environment, distributing, transforming, processing that which is beneficial and distributing it into the environment. Now, we want to look at the next. I'm trying to take this progression like we said, navigating it. So now I want to take it into the distribution of wealth, right? Like you said, and you topic request that we look at the distribution and look at issues today, important issues, and how does the Vedas guide us through this? So now when it comes to distribution of wealth, straight away, we're talking about politics, right? So in this first picture that you see, I really like this picture. All our political ideologies are determined by how we distribute our wealth, whether it's capitalism, socialism, or communism. Right? All of them say, no, 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 no. See, we are here, you know, capitalism, consumerism, all of that. No, 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 we're here to do the world good. Right? But we all know the history of capitalism, you know, and consumerism and how skewed the wealth is. So, and we see it the, in the next slide that you see in the first picture, you can see how the workers, it is at the sweat and blood of the workers that the capitalist yeah, enjoys his meal and he lives off that world. And look at the politicians, all of God and everything else the banks, the monies, the international monetary funds, all of that, all of them go hand in hand with the politics. And you know, there's a capitalist saying to you that you must believe. We know the Western world as being a wonderful world of Christians that believe. And, and their capitalism is the way that they find it. Then there's a communist who doesn't believe at all. And in between there some way you get you know, the socialist trying to strike a balance between the two. Now, we understand where does religion come into it? And people understandably, many people are disillusioned. Now in that same slide, because of the temples, the one before this, the temples and the gurus, you know, uh, they equally, like any capitalist, is busy you know, accumulating wealth. And sometimes they become the worst perpetrators of amassing wealth. And the same poor people that go to the temples of the money. You know, you heard this complaint in India as well. 
that these churches and temples and mosques, how many of them went back to the people with that money that they got from those people? Right? So what they're busy doing is amassing wealth and selling all kinds of new miracles to the people. And we are, you know, beguiled easily, you know, attracted and waylaid. So now, if you look at it, Anji, we we so, on to seven forty, uh, 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 you know, quarter to eight. So I'd like oh, you to okay. up, okay? Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, All right, no, people. That... Then let's move the slides quickly. What I'm sure. saying, then finally now, right? So yeah. So this is the Vedas then that are speaking about. If you take the you know Indo-European languages, Latin and Greek. Then we come across some important words and we go on. I think you know that, that is common knowledge to us. And we go to, it says, we should live our lives like the sun and the moon. Right? When we talk of the sun and the moon, the elements in giving equally, not judging, sharing what it has, the trees give the fruit, the rivers, the water, they don't judge and they don't ask for anything in return. So that is the message of the Veda. When you have anything, if you are like the sun, the rivers, the water, you share, you give, you don't judge. All right, let's move on then. And this is a philosophy that should relate to economics as well. Right? And nishkama karma is when you don't keep on hankering after some reward or the other. And we say we must learn to be like these trees, like the river and water, jo deta hai, wo devata hai. These are devatas that give. Hmm? Right, so the distribution of wealth and according to the Vedas is you draw your message from, I've touched on this already, Deva Nam Bukam, how it receives the Samagri and transforms it into a beneficial element. Right? And then, you know, how it, now this one here that we want to focus on is Sata Hasta. Right? That one there. Now, like the, the words Sata Dhara, Sahasra Dhara with the Ghee. Right? Similarly, in the Vanijya Vidhi, when you do the start of a business, the prayer, it says Sata Hasta, the labor comes with a hundred hands, but the distribution of those work, that labor, the harvest that you reap is distributed through a thousand hands. So the theme of a hundred streams and a thousand, it's a poetic style. Shata Dhara, Shata Hasta, Sahasra Dhara, Sahasra Hasta. Hmm? So it is distributed. Right? So, and then finally, I just want to say in conclusion that in this Vanijya Vidhi, what happens is you are taught again business like the stomach, again going back to nature, going back to the Havan. The Havan processes, distributes. The stomach receives the raw material of the food through the process of the agni and combustion and digestion, it goes to the intestine. And from there, the, your arteries and your blood vessels are the rivers, the canals, the highways and freeways through which that food is distributed to every cell of the body. Right? And if that food is not distributed evenly through, if you take the next slides, we say, mukhya muksa chahiye. Right? In the Ramayana, it says the leader or the political party that runs the country must be like the mukhya, like the leader, the political party or the leader. What it does is it receives the wealth and distributes it to everybody, like the body does. The stomach receives it through the intestines and the arteries, the highways and freeways. That's how the business is working. The business in the body, right? It is spreading it, mukhya, the muk. The leader receives it to the stomach, processes it, takes the raw material and makes it into a form, a product that is distributed throughout the entire body. Business, you receive the raw material, the factories with a hundred hands, the labor and produce the products, produce the harvest, and then through a thousand hands, it is distributed throughout. The so I think that the words, the ritu and ritual, ritu then, our ritual is the word ritual comes from ritu, the season, and rita, the rites, satyancha rita, 
on the basis of this satya, the truth. Right? We do this thing because in the very first verse of the Rig Veda, it says, Agnim ide purodita. We all should become, very first verse of the Rig Veda says, we should be like the Agni in the Havan that receives the Samagri and distributes it equally to the environment, like that in our business, in our body, the stomach receives that food, processes it and distributes it everywhere. Then now in business, we receive the raw materials in our factories and everywhere. We produce it and whatever we produce, we distribute to everybody equally without judging and everything. And Ubuntu in my last slide says, Ubuntu has a similar idea of sharing of a vision of everybody being, you know, you care for the other, the other person matters. So Ubuntu also encapsulates the same idea. All right, Karuna. I didn't expect to go uh, <laughs> longer than that. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paiji. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I think, friends, we must just uh, note that. Um, thank you very much. We must note we've gone over a bit of time as uh, as much as uh, we could. We've shared, and uh, of course, Paiji, uh, wonderful points. Let's see what uh, the uh, if there are any hands that are raised. Uh, we now open for discussion, so please go ahead. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question, share a comment? Please raise your hands. Please, if you don't have a question, make some comment. I'd like to know how you, if you felt, you know, there was some justice done, and whether I was able to trace it, you know, through the. I, I, I like think, take that boat through you know, this ocean yeah, of I think, knowledge. I think perhaps we should ask uh, uh, Bridge Pai. He, he, he threatened at the beginning that he would be doing that. He would be giving us a comment. Uh, thank you, Karna. And uh, uh, once again, the master with some, uh, I thought it was an excellent presentation. Uh, and what you've done is you've taken as you said, depending on whether it's 6,000 years or 4,000 years, uh, you know, before Christ. Above eight, yeah. And uh, you're relating it to the contemporary era. And that's the importance of what you're doing. It's the contem contemporary yeah. relevance. You spoke about redistribution, uh, you know, and uh, how we are deviating from that path of righteousness. Uh, and you know, I, your description of gambling is too vivid. I don't want to ask how you know about that, but that's we'll talk about <laughs> after the session. Uh, so, so Bissam, my suggestion is that you develop this into, you know, these days uh, people are looking at videos. I'm, I'm, I'm just wearing the Masala cap. You know, we've got over seventeen thousand followers on on Facebook, and if one puts a video presentation of what you have done. Uh, I think we will have a very large audience and then it gets forwarded and so on, you know. So we want to, obviously, we want to influence South Africa. Clearly, we, can we would like to be influence the world, but we're starting from home. And I think uh, a lot of people will be very interested and, you know, it will force all of us to, to get to do some introspection, but also to show the how and that's common to all of us, whatever your ideology, your linguistic orientation, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, the neo-Hindu movement, all of us must do Havan. And you have explained that contemporary relevance. So I would encourage you, I'll now call you Dr. Ram Bilas because the <laughs> academic cap comes in. Uh, so Bistram, I, I certainly think you need to develop this uh, into uh, a, a presentation that will get wider circulation. Thank you, well done. Thank you very much, Rijbhai. Are there any further points from anybody? It seems that whatever Dr. G has shared with us is quite clear and everybody is happy. And uh, we have the vice president of the Mahasabha saying, you know, this input uh, should be taken further. And uh, I think that uh, really makes the Arya Samaj uh, platform, uh, a useful platform to actually ensure that there's intellectual discussion. So uh, with that, we have five minutes left. 
And it would be nice to hear from you, Dr. G, if you up to the challenge that has been put across by uh, Bridge Pai. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Karuna, they have received an invitation from India as well because they have done previous presentations and when I was in India. So they did like my take on this and some issues. And uh, since you are asking, uh, they've invited me and I've already started the processes of, you know, all the presentations I've done. And like uh, Bridge has said, they, they want to record it and do it professionally. So they've asked me to come over. So I'm busy preparing for that. And mm -hmm. also starting some work. And uh, I hope to, yes, do like, maybe call it little documentaries or something like that. Yeah. Mm, many, many documentaries. Mm. Very, very good idea. But Bhaji, I think what is being asked for South Africa is, uh, you know, India is a world in its own. Mm. And they have different issues and we have different issues, you know. So like the Ubuntu resonates here. Mm. The, the wealth issues resonate here because of the inequalities. And I'm pretty sure in the diaspora, the same thing would come through. So, it, but I think you're up to the challenge. So that's great. Yes, yes, no, of course it'll have a, like I did today, it'll have a South African, you know. Good. Event to it, yeah. Good. All right, so I think that leaves us with a few minutes to bring the meeting to a close. And I know nobody raised a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, controversial points with you, but uh, there are a number of people who have said uh, Pandit Choba Singh has raised that the distribution of food in relationship with animals and performing its Distribution is an excellent uh, way of putting things across. Uh, Pranita has said that it's uh, an awesome uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, it's great to remind us. Uh, my sister Rekha Chandrekha Mohan is uh, again saying that it's a very intellectual inter interpretation, wonderful, uh, and a very creative presentation. Just thanking you. So I think Dr. G, all in all, everybody enjoyed your, your speech uh, in a great way. Uh, friends, our next lecture is going to be on the Vedic marriage. It's going to cover the value of the sanskar and why it is a key ritual within the modern society we live in. The lecture will be delivered by Pandit Yuvesh Sundar on Wednesday, the 15th of June uh, at seven o'clock. Please mark down the date. The invitations will be shared with you closer to the date. And I'm sure on behalf of everybody, if I say a very big thank you to Dr. Rambilas for the wise words, the interpretations, and to all the participants for a, a very engaging and informative one hour. I would like to bring this lecture to the close with uh, Shanti Part led by Pandita Oshni Hanuman. Please show your video and unmute yourself, Panditji. Okay, just a word of thank you from me to all of those that joined in. I see you are about 70 people joining in, so it's an honor to have so many people listen in and join in. So thank you all. Thank you very much for joining. And Ichi, please go ahead. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. G. That was very informative. I really enjoyed it. We will now end with Shanti part. Om Dyo Shanti Rantariksham Shanti Hi Prithvi Shanti Apaha Shanti Oshadaya Shanti Hi Vanaspataya Shantir Vishwe Devaha Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvam Shanti Shantir Eva Shanti Sama Shantir Edhi Om Shanti 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 Namaste. Namaste. Thank you, Karunaji. Thank you.